uh, and uh, from institutes we are formally welcome uh, Professor Messi from uh, University of Cape Town who agreed to deliver this uh, talk on uh, International Mother Tongue Day. Okay, IIT Goa has been celebrating uh, this since its inception and uh, we are so privileged to have Professor Mestri here this afternoon. Uh, so it's over to you, Savia. I, I will request all of you to mute your uh, mics um, and uh, for uh, to save bandwidth, if you could also uh, put the video off, that would be fine, other than our esteemed speaker. Yeah, Savia. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you to uh, our International Mother Language Day 2021 lecture. And uh, this afternoon, Professor Mestri is with us, and he is going to deliver the lecture. And uh, before we proceed uh, with the lecture, I'll uh, give you a brief introduction of Professor Mestri, though, of course, he is very well known and renowned, and most of us know him already. But uh, let me uh, just uh, give you a brief introduction of Professor Mestri. Uh, professor Rajan Mestri is an Emeritus Professor of Linguistics at the University of Cape Town, where he teaches social linguistics, including language contact and variation. He was head of the linguistics section from 1998 to 2009 and currently holds an NRF research chair in migration, language and social change. He was president of the Linguistics Society of South Africa from 2002 to 2009, and of the International Congress of Linguists from 2013 to 2018. He is a past co-editor of English Today. He was there from 2008 till 2012. And amongst his books, uh, book publications are Language in Indenture, A Sociolinguistic History of Bhojpuri Hindi in South Africa, published by Ratnaj in 1992. Reprint came in 2019. Introducing Sociolinguistics, uh, published by Edinburgh University Press. Second edition came in 2009. Language in South Africa, published by Cambridge University Press. It came out in 2002. And a Dictionary of South African Indian English, published by University of Cape Town Press in 2010. He is an elected member of the Academy of Science South Africa and the Royal Society of South Africa. He has recently been awarded an A1 rating by the National Science Foundation South Africa, recognizing him as a leading scholar in his field internationally for the high quality and wide impact of his recent research outputs. So my dear August audiences, please welcome Professor Mestri. And now I would request Professor Mestri to address the gathering. Sir. Thank you, Sabiha. I hope everyone can hear me. If there's a problem, please feel free to say so. It is a great pleasure to be asked to deliver the annual International Mother Language Day celebrations at the IIT Goa. And I hope to convince you that there are links between my home city, Cape Town, and Goa, and the Konkan of India. Let me briefly say that I do take Mother Tongue Day seriously. Uh, although I'm going to be speaking in English, uh, I will be playing you snippets uh, of other languages which are important to me. India is one of the countries with the richest linguistic heritages in the world. There are, uh, if you think about the countries which have the most linguistic diversity on the planet, then we're looking at India, Papua New Guinea, Nigeria, and a few other countries. And where linguists are concerned, uh, diversity is good, just as biodiversity is vital for the well being of the planet. We believe that cultural and ergo linguistic diversity are very important. In my talk today, uh, I'm not going to be talking about India's languages because People in India are much more competent to speak about that, but I'm going to speak about uh, the fate of mother tongues in diaspora, a century and more after migration, what is happening with Indian languages today. And I'm going to focus to keep this to a manageable time frame to speak on Bhojpuri, a language that I um, can speak, 
Um, and a language that I've researched extensively, that's in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, where the big city is Durban. And in the second half, I'm going to be talking about an important language, Kokni, as it's called in Cape Town, Konkani, of course, to you in India. So diaspora is the theme, and the word diaspora means dispersal. So the great migration of Indian people has been recorded in this wonderful encyclopedia brought out in Singapore, edited by historian from Fiji, Bridgelal. And uh, there's a general editor, Rajesh Rai, from India, but also in Singapore now, or possibly Australia. Now, when we talk about the diaspora, uh, historically, there are, I, I say, and this is my typology, four great movements of Indians out of India. What I call the first diaspora was almost two millennia ago, 2000 years ago, large scale movements by ship to coastal areas of Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, Africa, the east coast of Africa, Arabia, China, and so on, taking Hinduism and Indian languages, although they would have been very different from today. We're talking about really Prakrit, and we're talking about old forms of Tamil, and so on, to very, and Sanskrit to various parts of Asia and the other territories. That's more historical now. The second diaspora is very much alive. This was the era of British colonization, and the British took Indians within four years of the abolition of slavery in 1830. Within four years, Indians have been shipped as slaves. I use the word advisedly to Mauritius and to Cape Town, 1834 onwards in Mauritius and then to indenture, and indenture means a fixed contract with very little pay, but there was pay and freedom after five or 10 years to the sugar colonies that I will talk about shortly. And this was mostly in the 19th and early 20th century. The third diaspora is more voluntary. Indians moved for economic reasons to Britain from the 1950s onwards and a, a sizable presence there, and to America from the 1970s onwards, first as graduate students, and then from the 80s onwards in larger numbers, to the extent that we know that the Indian presence is very prominent in the United States, in the medical sphere, naturally, and in other spheres too. There's a fourth diaspora that I've added more recently of people who've moved under globalization. These are an interesting facet of young people, highly trained, the computer wallahs, if I may call them that, who are all over the place. One month they're in Cape Town, the second month they're back in Delhi, the third month they're in New York, fourth month in uh, Mexico, fifth month back in Delhi. So that's a very interesting migration in terms of language and cultural uh, maintenance. Of course, this is the globalization before COVID. So I'm interested in the languages that traveled uh, in the 19th century. And my research has been more of this vast belt of Bhojpuri, Maghi, Mathali, that Grierson called Bihari, and of Eastern Hindi, including Audhi, and of Braj, and of Hindi in, in and around uh, Delhi, Haryana. Allied to this indentured laborers uh, from the Telugu speaking area, Andhra Pradesh and the Tamil speaking area, Tamil Nadu uh, moved all over the sugar colonies uh, that I'll talk about shortly. And then a different movement, not of indentured laborers, but of free passenger Indians who came as small scale or large scale traders, or in the case of Gandhi, came as a lawyer from the UK to South Africa. And I'm going to share with you our most recent research on Konkani in Cape Town. Konkani is not spoken very widely in South Africa, but Cape Town is definitely the city if you want to taste Konkani of South Africa. So, Here's a map of the world, and let me just talk about those sugar colonies. 1830, the British 
and other European powers finally abolish slavery and their, their colonies are, are going to go bankrupt unless they find an alternative source of labor and they look to India for labor and move large numbers. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people between the 1830s and 1920s. So in a 60, 70 year period, almost a million Indians moved out to, first of all, Mauritius in 1834, secondly, Guyana in South America in 1839, thirdly to Trinidad via Snipal's little island in 1845, Natal, South Africa, uh, where I was born, and we might call that Gandhi's Desh uh, in 1860. Suriname, a large country in South America, 1875, and then to Fiji in 1893, sorry, 1879 onwards, okay? And the languages that were taken there were, as I've said, Tamil, Telugu, and Bhojpuri, and related Bhojpuri-like varieties were taken all over there. These were spoken as mother tongues for at least two and even three, and in some cases, four generations. So on Mother Tongue Day, we should congratulate all the sugar colonies for having kept forms of Indian languages alive for a long time, well over a century. However, today, those forms of Tamil, Telugu, and Bhojpuri are all endangered. They are not spoken so much, except in two places. And the two places are my congratulations to Fiji and to Suriname, where Sarnami Hindi and Fiji Hindi are very much alive. I am part of an international group who are saying, Apart from my own country, we want to support Indian languages abroad, and we are coming up with a means of writing Fiji, Hindi, and Sarnami that will help the local people to write down their languages, write down their stories, and help preserve the languages longer than they've survived elsewhere. However, Bhojpuri and Hindi are alive in Mauritius, but it's not easy to maintain Bhojpuri and Hindi um, and Creole and French and English. So Mother Tongue Day uh, really has should be considered to be heritage day for many parts of the sugar colonies today. And those languages are well worth celebrating uh, a rich heritage that is not just a, a history of migration from India, but a migration, uh, a history of adaptation to new territories in the world. These, the British wanted young, fit men to uh, work in the colonies. So these were not atypical of the first batch of indentured laborers to the colonies. This was one of the first ships to Durban, in Port Natal. Indians labored in the sugarcane fields. They, in some places, set up the sugarcane fields, as in Natal. There were no slaves in Natal. Plantations were started by the hundreds of thousands of Indians in the 19th century. These look like Telugu women working on a tea estate in Natal. And these are the long houses or barracks that they lived in after a long day's work from 6 in the morning till 6 p.m., sunrise to sunset, getting up before that uh, to work and labor in the sugarcane fields. So what happens in diaspora is that you have a rescaling of languages. The languages don't carry the exact same nuance that they did in India. They get retailored to fit new contexts and they carry new connotations. So in many of the colonies, a distinction between South and North Indians was fairly strong. And I've given you the languages that we associate with South Indians, Tamil, Telugu, and even Urdu, Dakni Urdu. And with North Indians, Hindi or Bhojpuri, Gujarati, Urdu, this time the Northern Urdu and Konkani. But there's also a class distinction between those who labored on the fields and those who did not. So trading class communities 
Gujarati and Konkani, indentured class Hindi, Urdu, Tamil, Telugu. A slight sense of difference in the past, but not so much today. Today, the indentured class are largely also educated, also in business, and so there's a community of interest. But interestingly enough, Gujarati, uh, which is associated with Hindus and Muslims equally in South Africa in terms of numbers, Urdu, Muslims only, as you expect, Konkani is, is associated not with Christians or with Hindus, but with Muslims only in South Africa. This is a kind of migration pattern. Where are the Christian Konkanis? They migrated to the UK and US. Where are the Hindus? They migrated to the US. Sorry, the Christians migrated more to East Africa, to Kenya especially. Okay, so the other adaptation that people had to do is that they have to um, cope with their new homes to learn new languages. And in South Africa, people learned English, Afrikaans in some provinces, Zulu in some provinces, and in major indigenous language, Zulu. Others learned a simple form of Zulu, what we call a pigeon, a pigeon fanagalo, a simple language of KwaZulu Natal, which is very interesting because it has Zulu words, but with English grammar and spoken by many, many Indians who are very important in adapting to this language. So let me share with you a little bit of the plantation experience. Many words were picked up in Natal that are not so well known in India. So these are part of a kind of Natali kind of Hindi. The first word in yellow is Girmit, which is known by everyone today. It means the contract that people signed to come to the colonies. Girmit is known in all the sugar colonies and it comes from the English word agreement, but people from UP and Bihar as it was then uh, or the Bengal presidency, as it was then, couldn't say agreement, they called it a girmit, and they called themselves girmitias, okay? I did a lot of historical work on this to see um, what we can learn from language itself about the practices of the British, and the practices were not very noble. For example, the recruiters frequently deceived people. They lied to them. There was even cases of kidnapping. Now, when I see things like that, I'm a skeptical. I wonder whether people are exaggerating. I want to see the proof. And the proof comes in the language itself. When I asked uh, old people in Natal, what did your mother or grandfather call the recruiters? Uh, sometimes they were called arkatias. Did they know the word Arkatia for recruiter, those who call them to come to work in Natal? They said, no, no, no. Our parents call them Taguas and Luteras, okay? Tags and Luters, all right? Interesting. Then I'm going to uh, give you this word here for a European overseer. What did your grandfather call a European overseer? Actually, this is not from Natal, this is from Fiji. In Fiji, they call the person a kulambar. What is a kulambar? You might not know this in India. I didn't know it in South Africa, but it comes from the English word to call a number. The one who calls your number is a European overseer, a Kulambar. That's quite interesting. Every indentured Indian was given a number uh, and a certificate. Uh, and those are actually important historical documents that we value today. I've mentioned UP and Bihar as uh, places that the North Indians came from. So the Bhojpuri speakers came from, this is a random sample, 1,384 immigrants. Uh, you'll have to multiply by 50 to get the actual numbers. So about 60,000 came from that area. So at the top of the list, the, the district or the Zilla or Jilla that sent the most people to Natal was Basti, 98, Gonda, 83, Ajamgar, Ghazipur, Sultanpur, Fizabad, Patna, Gaya, Alabad, those are the most sending areas, but you can see many, many areas to which people were sent. 
so the Basti number of 98 would be about 5,000 people from Basti Jila came to Natal. And equally, they, these, vil these villages are well represented in all the other colonies. So there was really a devastation of young, able-bodied men and women uh, from these uh, from these districts of India. Out of interest, my own uh, great-grandparents, uh, and in one case, one great-great-grandparent came from these areas. So my Aja, my father's father, came from Basti. On my mother's side, my mother's father came from Allahabad. On my father's mother's side, there were people from, uh, they came from Patna, uh, as well as Fizabad. So this is all very uh, interesting to us uh, in terms of our heritage. So what kind of Bhojpuri or Audi or Hindi developed on the plantations of Natal? Here, uh, this map represents 200 uh, kilometers in this little area here. So a vast belt from near Bengal to near I guess, Haryana and so forth. This is about 800 miles, right? Over a thousand kilometers, a wide belt in which many languages were spoken. Mathali, Maghi, Bhojpuri, Bagheli, Audhi, Braj, and some Kardiboli. So obviously all these dialects couldn't survive on the plantations. Within a generation, people accommodated to each other. And in black here, you have the most dense areas from which people migrated to Natal. And these are, you can see Basti, Gonda, Azamgarh, and these are precisely on the belt between Bhojpuri on the side and Audi on that. So what we have in South Africa is an amalgam of all these dialects. And this amalgamation is called a koine. A koine is a new dialect from, from old dialects and it's mutually intelligible. If it were not mutually intelligible, we'd call it a Creole, but these are not uh, Creoles. These are clearly mutually intelligible. And very quickly, to show you this uh, amalgamation of features, accommodation, there's some features that are from Western Bhojpuri. For example, Hamgaili is I went. So the leaf form is very salient in South Africa. But we also have some forms from Eastern Hindi and Audhi. So she went will be U Gais with the S, and they went will be U Gain with an N at the end. So all these survive, uh, but there's a consensus, and the second generation formed a new koine, which they stabilized and passed on to the third and fourth generations. The word hum doesn't mean we as in Bhojpuri of India, it's singular, it means I or me. If I want to say plural, we would say hamlong, okay? And within a paradigm, I see is hamdekila, and the la form is very much Bhojpuri. But the second person you see, we don't say tu dekela, we say tu dekehe, and this is more like Eastern Hindi, Audhi, and Western Hindi. So this is what we mean by a koine, really mixing and drawing and accommodating everybody into a new speech form. So this is a, a koine. Uh, this koine has survived for three, four generations. However, today uh, there are not many fluent speakers. The younger speakers of this kind of Bhojpuri are in the late 50s or early 60s. In fact, the um, youngest person that I know was about 57 years old who could speak this. He learned it from his parents. He could speak this way. Uh, sadly, we lost him to COVID in December. And I think we have lost the youngest speaker of the old form of Bhojpuri. Nowadays, people can speak some Hindi thanks to Bollywood or thanks to the effort of the Hindi Shiksa Sang in South Africa. Uh, but by and large, language shift is taking place as people learn English and use it as the home language. So I'm just going to take a short water break.
I've come to the second half of my talk. And this is not about the Indian shit, but about people in Cape Town who came as free Indians to set up trade. And the Kunkni community form a very interesting uh, community internationally and a good contrast with the indentured workers. Their story too is one of pride in their heritage of some degree of linguistic change, but there is a twist in their story that I think is worth telling. So whereas uh, Bhujpuri, uh, the Bhujpuri belt was out here and the, their port is Calcutta and my mother's generation all call themselves Calcatias i.e. we came via the port of Calcutta, irrespective of where your home village is, you are Calcutta's. Well, now we're shifting to Mumbai, all right? We're took, talking about Mumbai as a port, not Madras, all right? And so the Konkan uh, language survives in South Africa for over 130 years, and that is remarkable. So if we look at where the Konkani language is spoken in India today, it's a long, thin belt, as you know, the states of Maharashtra, Goa, your territory, Karnataka, and even a little bit of Kerala, I believe. So this is really a kind of thin belt. And the areas to which people migrated to South Africa were mostly out here. Not too far north, definitely not south, not Goa, it's a pity, would have liked to have met people from Goa more often, but we meet Konkans from the Konkani belt out here. I love maps, so I'm gonna should be showing you even more maps. Here's a map that we drew ourselves at the University of Deccan College, Pune, my college the colleagues, uh, Ruta Paratka and Sonal Kulkarni Joshi, who I'll talk about uh, later. Uh, uh, together with me had this map drawn up by a geographer showing the villages from the Konkan to which people migrated to Cape Town. And here, two districts, uh, Ratnagiri and Raigad are very strong. So villages like Morba, Msala, Murud, uh, Dabat Ladvan, Harne, Sakrol, Ked, Karji, all these are well-known names in Cape Town and they are celebrated. And I think it's worth celebrating on Mother Tongue Day internationally. And here are the maps again, just in case you didn't get enough. So this is the more northern part, Murud, Msala, Srivardhan, Manga, Nizampur, okay, these are in Raiga district. And this, on the right hand side is the south, so south of this area in Ratnagiri district, Harne, Chiplu, Ked, uh, and Sangameshwar are districts well known. In fact, in Cape Town, people take their surnames from some of these districts. So the Harnes give us Harnekar, the Muruds give us Murudkars in Cape Town. Uh, the Karji gives us Karjikars and so on. Now, it was my great pleasure to go with Rutal, uh, Ruta Paratkal doing a PhD under Sonal Kurkani Joshi at Deccan College and myself. And we went on a jaunt in 2017. We went from Pune down here into Raigad and Ratnagiri. And we had a sample. They know the areas much better than me. And to me, it was utterly fascinating to see Konkani, Marathi, Urdu, Hindi, and English all surviving. So the theme I want to share with you via pictures is how strong the link is between South Africa and the Konkan. These pictures are of South Africa in India. This is the uh, village of Murad, and this school was built with money from Cape Town. All right, and we met these school officials and they're very mindful of the Cape Town contribution. Here in Bordley village is a restaurant called Golden Dish and I got very excited because the original Golden Dish is in Cape Town and a migrant to Cape Town liked the name and he changed it uh, and added uh, it to his home village. Then in Latvan, 
in, in Ratnagiri, here's another high school, the national high school. And again, it's been funded with money from Cape Town. That's Ruta Paratka. And this is the uncle of an MA student of mine who did an MA on Afrikaans and Konkani in Cape Town. And that's her uncle who was our host for the day. So strong is the Cape Town link that there are two maps of South Africa on the walls, right? And there's no map of India, okay? So um, the presence is very strong, although I have to say no longer is the Cape Town presence as prominent because people are now moving to Dubai and to London. They are stories about Cape Town not being so pleasant and welcoming and crime-free anymore. Still, the South African presence remains. I've shown you South Africa in India. Now it's time to show you India in South Africa. Latvan village survives in Cape Town in the name Latvan Road and Latvan Park on the right here. Janjira, which is near Murud, I guess, Janjira, the fort, famous fort, survives uh, in Cape Town, and this is a hardware store celebrating its name. So what's interesting is that where does the indentured people soon lost the link with their villages? They all love India and they love Indian culture, music, etc. But the actual memory of the village is not strong. This is not true of Konkan, uh, Konkanis in Cape Town. They are all know their villages. We've counted up to 21 villages of origin known in Cape Town. People still have a strong village identity and they might even have distinct village dialects that have survived in Cape Town. And that is an astonishing story that there should be not a koine, not one common South African or Cape Town Konkani, but there are at least at least three dialect forms which have survived. And we think that is really very interesting linguistically and sociolinguistically. The village identities are very strong, as I've shown you, Janjira, Latvan, and other societies still survive today. They, these societies meet once a year, COVID permitting. They have exhibitions, they have shows, they even have plays, and the plays uh, are in Urdu, Konkani, English, and even a bit of Afrikaans. So uh, the heritage today is multilingual, but Konkani has not been forgotten. Now, Ruta Paratka is doing a PhD. Uh, it's mostly based in Deccan College, Pune, but I am also helping supervise. And her work, based on extensive fieldwork in Cape Town, with my assistance and the cooperation the wonderful cooperation of the Muslim community of Cape Town. It looks like we don't have 21 village varieties. That would be too many. We have more or less a Kalusta aligned variety, a Latvan aligned variety, and a Hapsan uh, aligned variety. Habs the Hapsan area is in the Murud Janjira Fort kind of area. Uh, Latvan and Kalusta are in North and South Ratnagiri district, respectively. So what we're finding is that rather than a koine, a common form forming, people still maintain allegiance to a Kalusta-like variety, a Latvan-like variety, and a Hapsan-like variety. Why is this so? Is an interesting story. But let me first give you the evidence for it, all right? And this is based on Ruta's ongoing PhD. We think she'll finish by the end of the year. Uh, if you look at the adverbs of place, the words here and there, I've changed your spelling slightly, Ruta, if you are in the audience, to make them a little more accessible. And the words for here are hatta in the Kalusta variety of Cape Town, but it's hite or ite in the Latvan variety and it's higher in the Hubsan variety. These are discoveries to me, but the community in Cape Town know this. They know and they make jokes about it, or observations about it. And the word for there is tata or tata, otite or taya, 
all right? Incidentally, these are words for here and there. As a linguist, I'll tell you, they sound a little like the words hither and thither, T-H-I-T-H-E-R. And in fact, the words here and there are Indo-European. These are the same words shared in uh, Germanic languages, uh, many European languages, and in Indo-Aryan languages of, of India. Then another interesting form is for the infinitive, the form to say to, with a verb, to go, to walk, to play, or a dative meaning for, the purpose of, for the purpose of, or to do this. The Kalusta variety uses the verb form, whether it is, you know, chal, or to go, or whatever, ya plus la, but the Latvan variety prefers u plus ka, or sometimes kala. And the Hapsan variety of Cape Town is somewhat in between. I think it has year plus la. So there's still village variation after 140 years of the first migrations of Cokneys to Cape Town. And I think we should celebrate that on Mother Tongue Day. Diversity even within one language in one city. So let me give you an example of what Konkani Kokni, as it's pronounced in Cape Town. Kokni is the way it's said. And we know that in India, the language is pronounced Konkani, except when we went to the villages of the Konkan, we found that Muslims say, yeah, we also say Kokni. All right, that was quite interesting to me. So I'm going to play you, this is just 30 seconds of what Kokni might sound like in Cape Town. You can have a quick look at this slide here before I do that. Uh, and I'll play that. It might look like it's going to crash, but it shouldn't. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear this clearly in 30 seconds time. <laughs> okay, so that's great. I want to try and close this and I hope I don't make any mistakes here. Um, so unfortunately, there's so many icons, it's a bit of a problem going back to my PowerPoint. If you just give me a second. If I lose you, then we'll have to start again. Yeah, okay, so I wanna close this, here we go. Right. Um... Excuse me, sir, you can use that minus sign on the uh, top right side. Sorry, uh, out here? You can use it, oh. yes, sir. Okay, excellent. I'm so glad I have an expert here. Um, so, here is the text there. I've, again, re-spelt it a little bit. I don't know how you spell in Goa, I believe there are many scripts and debates, etc. This is not perfect spelling. It's a mixture between what the linguists do and what I thought is uh, more accessible to non-linguists. But in that sample that we played you, uh, there were quite a few forms of, of to go. See, we should go or we had to go. And here's a speaker saying, yeah. And here's her partner that you've heard, husband and wife team saying, Kala. And for a brief while, the husband says ka because he's heard his wife saying kala, but usually he uses yala, wonderful traveling to India. So the husband who's from one set of districts uses a la form generally. The wife uses a kala form because of the districts of origin there. So there's no immediate accommodation. People more or less use the village aligned variety. Now, there's an interesting story about the villages and Konkan. In the Konkan, Muslims would marry, uh, I'm not sure about Hindus, but the Muslims would marry people within the next seven villages. Very practical. You don't have to travel all day for the wedding. You marry within the se next seven villages. That custom was carried over to Cape Town. So for a while, every 
Konkani person of the second generation knew the seven villages from which their ancestors would intermarry. They could rattle them off, all right? And in the second generation in Cape Town, many of the community tried to look for brides, not from a different district in Cape Town, but from one of those seven districts, if possible, in the Konkan. And I think that's very interesting. And that helps us understand why a koine wasn't formed, but that the village identity and village forms remain so strong in, uh, in Cape Town, in diaspora. And this is like almost unique in the sociolinguistics of the world. We want to sing it from the rooftops that uh, not coinization doesn't always occur. It depends on the situation. So what was the situation? Well, unfortunately, Konkri was one of several Indian languages for culture and song and reading. People had to learn Urdu and Arabic. Uh, for everyday business, they had to learn Afrikaans. For education, they had to learn English. So Konkani receded as a mother tongue. We have to understand that. Although people were still very proud of it and spoke it as much as they could. But the truth is they used it best and most often with people from India and their family when they visited every two or three years back in the village. All right, so this is interesting. You speak Afrikaans to other Cape Townians, you speak English to other Cape Townians and Indians, but Kokni, you tend to speak more to close family members of the seven villages. And when you go back to visit, you speak that variety. Hence the village varieties have survived very well end of the puzzle. So I'm um, come to my last, second last slide. As I say to Indians, and I spoke before I came on PowerPoint here, I spoke on uh, Radio Lotus in Durban uh, on mother tongue heritage. And I said to people, they should not be ashamed if they haven't been able to keep their languages. The fact that Indians kept the languages in South Africa for well over 120 years, that today they are under threat, nevertheless means that they have some reason to be proud because the government did very little to support Indian languages. In fact, they wanted to send all Indians back to India or they said, we'll allow you to stay, this was in the 1940s, we'll allow you to say, provided you learn and use English and become westernized. Nevertheless, Indians kept up their culture. Now, the sad thing that I hear <laughs> is that actually Bhojpuri and Konkani might not be doing so well in Bihar and the Konkan as well. Sabia Hashami's thesis, PhD 2015 on Bhojpuri in Bihar shows that increasingly young and even not so young people are shifting towards Hindi. Now that's fine. Um, you know, for me, Bhojpuri and Hindi are not radically different, but it is a kind of Bhojpuri Hindi or a Bihari Hindi or what Sabia calls a contact Hindi that is being used uh, in Bihar today. All right. So if the shift going on in India, what hope is there for the sugar colonies? Here's a reference to her PhD. And then the last slide is to give you the reference to Ruta Paradkar's work. It's still not complete on Konkani diaspora in Cape Town. And she and her supervisor, Sonal Kulkarni Joshi, on the basis of extensive field work going to the villages of the Konkan, uh, have found that Muslims in the Konkan tend to speak um, to be slowly shifting to Marathi and Urdu, that they can understand Konkni, but they don't always uh, speak it anymore. In fact, here's an interesting facet of interaction. Some of the Konkni speakers of Cape Town tell us, you know, when we go back to India, some of them can't speak Konkni like us. We speak better Konkni than them. These are the older people, younger ones, unfortunately. Uh, Afrikaans and English wallahs in Cape Town, not their fault, uh, but they do take pride in the vocabulary that they remembered of their grandparents' generation. So there's something interesting, huh? In, in some ways, the old Kokani survives better in Cape Town than in the Konkan, where with education, 
with uh, maybe travel and jobs and upward mobility, people are shifting to Marathi and Urdu. So I want to say, if you were expecting me to say, to stand on my chair here, wave my fist in the air and say, we got to speak our uh, mother tongue, Hamara, Bahashe, etc. As a sociolinguist, I have to understand that loyalty to language is important. But in diaspora, those loyalties have to change. It's a very complex world, uh, but we fully support the idea of Konkani and Bhojpuri as languages of heritage, if no longer quite the mother tongue of the younger generation. I think I will stop here and thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think now we can take questions from the audience. If anyone have questions, they can ask directly to sir, or you can put them in the chat box. Yeah, you can write. Hello. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, of course, you will be. Uh, somebody has asked uh, regarding the recording of the session. Yeah, of course, you'll be get. You, you may get uh, the recording of the session. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Mestri, for uh, this very interesting and informative talk. And uh, for uh, 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 Shabia, yes. before before uh, you. Uh, Close this. I, I had a question. I mean, no. Yes, sir. I, I was about to ask about that only. I was about to yeah, say that. Yeah. 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 yeah, I just noticed one person from my state migrated to South Africa in that sample that he studied. That was only one. And uh, so, uh, so why is that only most people, those who migrated, they migrated from uh, either North or from south, but not so much from uh, southeast, if you will, uh, south of uh, West Bengal. So, uh, may I ask which district, which district that was? Uh, that was that was in Odisha, uh, the uh, Oriya speakers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Um, I wish there were more Oriya speakers, uh, <laughs> but they weren't. Now, when you see one, you must multiply by 50 because that was a random sample. In other words, a random sample means not random, actually. It means absolutely systematic. So oh, I, I did see. that. I took a history. I, I used a historical work. So what they did was they took 5% of the data. Remember, 150,000 names in the record. So they said, we will look at every 50th page and we'll pull out uh, the names on every 50th page and work out their villages, etc. From that, I worked out what languages they must have spoken. So when you see one multiplied by I, 50, so but 50 uh, is still not not a lot. I didn't find any features of Odisha, or I didn't look very hard when, when I saw there were so few. But I must tell you, in, in south of Durban, in my hometown, there is a hotel called the Orissa Inn. Uh, someone oh. liked the name, and there is an Orissa Inn run by Indians from South Africa. It's very nice. So why did people come from some areas and not others? Well, the British headquarters was in Calcutta at the time. So the British would start and that was a capital. They would then start and the port was in Calcutta. So they would start their recruiters as close as possible, but they soon found that the Bengalis weren't that keen to move and they had to go into the interior uh, from east to west. And the area that were the most impoverished, there were famines of the time, 
Uh, it could well be the backlash of the Indian mutiny, so-called mutiny of the time of the uprising, meant that there was greatest poverty in that border area between Bihar and UP. So many people uh, saw a chance of a better life um, and moved to any of the colonies uh, for a long time. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the end of my response. <laughs> thanks, 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 thanks. Uh, I also have a question, Professor Mystery. Sure. Uh, yeah. So in your talk, it was, of course, very interesting and uh, uh, especially uh, regarding coinization uh, not taking place uh, in Cape Town uh, company. Uh, this uh, uh, phenomena that you discussed about uh, that uh, this is very interesting to know that uh, they have this seven village rule in Konkan regarding marriage amongst Muslims and uh, they marry uh, only around seven villages next to their, their own village and they follow the same rule in Cape Town and that's not about uh, the seven districts around them but the same seven villages that are here in Konkan around their village so uh, and and uh, still, uh, coinization is not taking place in uh, Cape Town of Konkani. So what would be the reason? The reason is uh, perhaps because uh, they are not actually living in proximity and uh, they are getting married because uh, uh, their villages are in proximity in Konkan or um, a strong village identity. What, what might be the reason for coinization not taking right. place? Yeah, sure. Let me first correct uh, the impression. Uh, that I may have given, the seven village rule was strong in the first and second generation. Today's generation, they're still aware of it. Young people, even some of the young people know about the story. They might not even remember all seven, but the young people know about it, even make jokes about it. But I would say today that seven village rule has been relaxed, all right? Um, so to answer your question, for coinization to take place, there's got to be a lot of interaction so that I, I willingly am uh, influenced by the way you speak and you are influenced by the way I speak and everyone is influenced by the way that everyone speaks if they have lots of interaction. And at the end of the day, the most prestigious people and the most demographically numerous village will win out. That's what coinization is, yeah. the one that has prestige and the one that is most common. Uh, now, in the Konkani situation, that didn't happen because for prestige, it's more Afrikaans and English. Demographically, uh, Ratnagiri is quite strong, but not only Ratnagiri, Raigad as well, and the villages. And you speak more Konkani, as I said, to the uh, grandparents more than anyone else and you speak even more Kokni when you travel to India and there you meet your family in the same village and that gets reinforced so what that's my my answer would be that there was reinforcement from the close links with kinship uh, kinfolk in India that had a greater role in reinforcement than face-to-face -face interaction in Konkani in Cape Town. There was that, but it was not as influential. And a lot of people, more so the men perhaps, would start uh, laughing and joking in Afrikaans. That became a kind of vernacular language that overtook Konkani. Just as for the youngest generation today, English is overtaking Afrikaans as a vernacular language. Okay. Okay. So it was uh, because of uh, reinforcement of the village uh, variety when uh, they were speaking to uh, their right. uh, villages back here or or to the grandparents that kept them this village identity strong and there, therefore it couldn't take place. That's right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a question, uh, Professor Mistry. Um, uh, this is this is a, just an interesting event. Uh, I, I was with my family near Eiffel Tower, and one family, about ten members, twelve members, they were there, and they're talking 
you know, uh, I, I don't know, other people in the audience may not understand much. They're talking strict Bhojpuri and I belong to that region, but I could not understand uh, everything of it. They say, ke, hene awa, hene awa, uh, andhar hota, means that come here, it's getting darker. And I was, uh, my whole family, my wife was excited to hear that. Then they, then we called that uh, uh, family and asked, ki, do you belong to Bihar and, uh, and belong to, uh, I told my hometown, because that is where it is strictly spoken. So no, 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 in, in their own language, they spoke, no, we don't belong to that. They, they didn't know any English, any Hindi, only Bhojpuri. Uh, then uh, I said, but you you belong to Bihar. So no, 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 nine, nine. Uh, so they kept, uh, then finally they said we belong to Suriname, I mean, in their own language, and they didn't yeah. know any other language. Uh, and they said, no, we don't know Bihar, we don't know this thing. Then right. I said, do you have any senior person in your family? So they, they called a very old man. <laughs> and uh, then uh, he said, yes, centuries before we, our family migrated. He also talked in Bhojpuri only, strict Bhojpuri. So he said, Ki, we migrated our family. Right? So that is, the, so he said, Ki, in Suriname, everybody speaks this language. Yes, look, I think that's a very, very good anecdote that you've shared. It's a precisely what we should be sharing on Mother Tongue and Heritage Language Day. The story of Suriname is indeed, you know, Suriname is an incredibly inhospitable place in terms of not the people, the people are great, but the terrain, you know, forests, swamps, mountains. And so people are, get quite isolated. And... Sarnami, they call it Sarnami or Sarnami Hindi or Hindustani, and it is definitely an offshoot of uh, Audhi and Bhojpuri. Um, <coughs> the younger ones in Paris, I bet you they speak Dutch because a number of them with political issues in, in their home country, many have migrated to Holland, the mother country, not Britain. And Sarnami is definitely alive. More than that, other people have learned Sarnami culture. I've met some Creole people uh, who say they know the words, they, they know the prayers, the food, uh, and so on. So Sarnami, Hindustani culture is very strong. The language is strong as it is in Fiji. Those are two places that deserve our support if we want to support overseas Hindi. Um, and I share your thing. When I'm in Dubai, not often, uh, you know, on, on a plane connecting somewhere or in, in Holland, etc. And I hear a Bhojpuri kind of Hindi. I find it so much easier. I feel I really want to speak to them. But I have to be careful because people think it's very strange. Who is a stranger, uh, etc. But there is a bond between the diasporic people and those who speak a Bhojpuri kind of Hindi, for sure. And I think we should be collecting those anecdotes. People from India, perhaps send them to me. This is the kind of thing, if we, we don't collect that heritage, we will lose that. And I think we've been cut off from India too long. Uh, we are also slightly afraid of Indians finding our culture and language, you know, not, not so should, etc. Uh, but I think it's time for us to document um, all of that. Uh, but I'm pretty certain that those younger people in Paris knew both Dutch as well as uh, Sarnami. Okay, we have a question here in the chat box. So it is from Nazneen, uh, and uh, she's saying, "Good evening from India. Are there any words which have been loaned from Konkani to Afrikaans?" Right. Uh, look, uh, Konkani uh, words because it's a minority in Cape Town. Uh, it's not very influential, but some words are. If you go shopping at our biggest shops, you'll find something called Kokni Masala. And when I first came from Durban, I didn't know what Kokni Masala is. And I, my friends tell me 
it is same as masala from India, spices, but with uh, coconuts, uh, crushed coconut in it. So that sounds very much like the Konkan area. So Kokni masala, barishap. Huh? Barishap you will find for fennel uh, is uh, known in Cape Town. So people outside the Kokni community have heard of barishap and it's advertised. Uh, sometimes the shops will say fennel, sometimes they'll say barishap. Um, other words, uh, there must be other words, but they're also common words, not just to Kokani, but to Indians generally. So dhania is well known in South Africa uh, for coriander. The shops can sometimes say, and the marketplaces will advertise dhania uh, and so on. Then there's a the word buta and buti, meaning bhai and behin. Uh, that's more with the Malay community and the Konkani and the Malay communities are fairly strong together uh, uh, as uh, Muslims. They have close relations, uh, intermarried sometimes as well. So with Buta Buti, I didn't think it's Konkani, but I'm now wondering, maybe you can tell me, does that word sound familiar to you or is it more from Malaysia, Indonesia? I don't know. I'm not a linguist, but maybe there could be a sort of a basis from Prakrit where you have brata for brother. So, you know, some kind of a... Yeah, right. Yeah. Good, good uh, thought. Brata to Buta. Is it via Konk, the Konkan or via Indonesia would yeah. be very interesting at the moment. To me, it sounds like more via Indonesia. You, you I can expect that. Yeah. Um, I guess the word uh, achar, the word achar for pickle is in Afrikaans. They pronounce it acha because they don't pronounce the R, acha, uh, achar. But that's also not just from Konkani, it's, you know, Hindi uh, as well uh, and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Um, may I just say, I don't know if Ruta Paratka is in the audience and if she wants to say something, whether she's got connectivity in Goa. She herself is from Goa, but she's researching the Konkani of the yeah. Konkani in Cape Town. If she wants to add a few points or correct anything I've said, maybe I can ask her to have a quick word. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? I'm here. Yeah, Ruta. Yes. Hello. Yeah. So uh, just something, I, I, I agree with you, Professor Mestri. Butta, Butti, I think uh, it doesn't sound Kokani. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Otherwise, I don't really want to. Uh, yeah, I just want to add uh, a little something if there are people from Goa here who speak Kokani, because there is someone, uh, there is a, a message in the chat box that it seems like it's Marathi. So um, uh, this is like on the, this is not exactly Goan Kokni that we hear in Cape Town. This is a different kind of Kokni, very specific to the Kokan. But um, yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to add really, because there was a comment in the chat box. Okay, thank you, Ruta. Yeah. And just to check, yeah. uh, nevertheless, Buta Buta, not from Kokni, but used within the Kokni community as well to some extent? Uh, I haven't come across it really, okay. but right. uh, I don't know. There may I have uh, heard the word, um, yeah, bhana for sister. That I think yeah. is common to the Indian community again. Hmm. And uh, uh, titi, I think that's Afrikaans, is it? Titi for sister. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether, because I, I heard it only once, in only one sample, yeah, right. but yeah. uh, that's all, yeah. Okay. Otherwise, it's normally Pana, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, it might be used, but uh, Malay it's more seems... Formal. It's more informal, it wouldn't be used in the home, but it's more like with people hanging out, and it's more Afrikaans, uh, but I have seen it in the play, for example, when I was looking through some of the brochures uh, that the okay. society bring out here. The societies bring out very good brochures. And I did see the word 
quite prominently in one of the texts of the plays, uh, for example. Oh. But that is probably drawing okay. on the. That's Afrikaans interesting for me. I'm, I've never yeah. heard it. So. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Oops. Very, uh, yeah. Very interesting uh, discussion going on. So, do we have any more questions? Students, if you have any more questions and also other guests. Seems uh, we do not have any yes. more questions. And uh, okay, we have one question and uh, in the chat box, and it is from Rahul. Rahul Goet. He is asking: Is there a pattern which language survives, or it's just random? Uh, yeah. Look, um, you know, uh, in migration, which languages survive best? Um, unfortunately, it's the most powerful. In order for a language to survive, uh, you must be have control of the environment. You have the control of the territory. So when small numbers of Konkanese and Bhojpuri people or even people from Africa migrate to Europe, we have this expectation that people must shift language. But when the British traveled or the Dutch traveled or the French, there wasn't that expectation that their languages would not survive. So, and the reason is they control the environment, they control the resources uh, and they were in power. So the power dynamic is important. Those who are able to establish uh, a kind of base and have control over the communicative modes, uh, their languages survive the best. Uh, in Fiji, why has uh, Fiji Hindi survived uh, the best? Because there are not that many languages. Uh, Hindi or Bhojpuri was the majority language of the Indians. In Natal, there were more Tamil speakers than Bhojpuri speakers. And there were also those speakers had friends who were Telugu and Urdu uh, and, and Gujarati speakers. So a kind of lingua franca developed. That lingua franca was English in Natal, but that lingua franca in Fiji was Hindi. People learned English, but the lingua franca was Hindi. So in Fiji, Tamil speakers uh, speak and write uh, Bhojpuri and Hindi. Um, so it's the relative demographics that are also important. Uh, the size, yeah, the size of the community, uh, not too much competition between languages, but also I guess um, a desire to keep up with an external homeland as well. So uh, the truth is, though, that once outside the terrain, unless people aren't in a powerful and colonizing relation uh, to keep to maintain a language is really not at all easy. So I think on mother tongue and heritage language day, we should salute the people I've talked about for keeping the languages alive and now facing difficulties after 140 years. Okay, I have another question. It is also from a student. If uh, we are talking about Bhojpuri, then which variety of Bhojpuri is spoken in South Africa? Uh, like I say, it's a koine. So it's a koine meaning that it doesn't accord with exactly the Bhojpuri, let's say, of Basti district, even though that sent the most migrants to South Africa, including my father's father, my Aja, as we call him. I never met him, but anyway. Uh, so it isn't one district, but it is more on the western side of Bhojpur, uh, closer to Audhi, 
rather than to eastern Bhojpur, closer to Maghi and to eventually to Bengali. All right. So what we have is an, an amalgam. That's what I mean by koine, closest to Bhojpuri, but Audi like in some ways, uh, and so on. So Western kind of Bhojpuri uh, is as close as I can put it. Thank you. Uh, so we do not have any more questions now. So, hello. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. You are. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So we do not have any more questions now, and uh, we can. Uh, now uh, propose the vote of thank and uh, well, thank everyone for coming here hmm? so good evening once again everyone and on behalf of the organizing committee i would like to first and foremost uh, thank our esteemed guest, uh, Professor Rajan Mesturi, for accepting our invitation and that too for a talk on Sunday. So, uh, and for delivering this immensely informative and interesting talk and today. So, it has been an honor to have you uh, here. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and coming here today. Uh, and I would uh, also like to thank Professor B.K. Mishra, Director of IIT Goa, for all the support, guidance, and encouragement. Thanks are due to Professor Sachin Kore, Dean Academic Program and Student Affairs, for all the help and support. Professor Subuti, Dean R&D, Professor Biswas, Professor in Charge Faculty Affairs, Professor Bahadur, and Mr. Mohammed Shakil, Registrar um, IIT Goa, for all the support. I would like to say a big thank you to all the colleagues working in academic section, especially Mr. Abhishek Gupta, Assistant Registrar Academic, and uh, Ms. Ashwini Gopankar and uh, Roni Singha. Also to colleagues working in uh, SITS, Dr. Sharad Sinha and Dr. Srijit Avi in charge SITS, and Mr. Amol Kamle and Mr. Raghavendra for providing tech support today. And uh, a lot of thanks to Mr. Mushtaq Khan in a director's office for being so efficient and organized. And a huge thank you is due to student organizers, Mr. Ganesh Vemula and his team for from BTEC first semester for making the poster, and Mr. Saksham Goel, General Secretary Cultural, for his help in organizing the event. Last but not the least, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all my colleagues, students, and guests from IIT Goa, Goa University, University of Cape Town, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Jadavpur University, and all other esteemed organizations for joining us today for this talk. I'm sparing uh, time uh, for uh, this talk on Sunday afternoon for coming here. Thank you so much and have a great evening ahead. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Mestri. Thank you. It it has been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. And we hope to have you in person someday soon. Sure. sure. Thank you. Thank you.